Hello, welcome back to another weekly What's Up with Wigwam. I am, of course, with Wigwam, and you're seeing this intro because, yet again, this video was filmed literally months ago. So, I just wanted to stop in and explain to you why, you know, this is all different, and it also looks like I have a haircut. It's from the before times when haircuts were still a thing people could get. It's getting long, to be honest with you. So, anyways, just wanted to also say, if you haven't stopped by our Twitch channel yet, twitch.tv backslash Aaron Wigwam, I am streaming six days a week, about six hours a day, and we're having a lot of fun, honestly. So, check it out. I hope you enjoy this video. Top 20 through 11 best games of all time, according to me, a random guy on the internet. Hope you love the video. I love you guys. Enjoy. Woo! Going away. Enjoy the video! Fun! So for this episode and next episode, two-parter, must be like a season finale or something, we're gonna talk about my favorite games of all time. I wanted to do this as a top 10 list, but as I started to list out the games, there's just too many games I've played in my 27 years of being alive to just narrow it down to only 10. It would be doing a disservice to the other 10 runners up and even then I almost considered just doing like a 30 or 50 list even but that would have been that would have been a lot of episodes and I don't want to do that so top 20 this will be 20 through 11 the next episode will be the exciting conclusion of the top 10 games so let's get at it with number oh also before I get into this I should mention that I don't have the fancy scrolly number things for 20 through 11 and I'm not gonna make them so you're gonna deal with whatever I decide to edit and put in the video and I don't want to hear about it so and, and another another note when I was listing my favorite indie games in the last episode and then relisting all of my favorite games in this episode they didn't necessarily end up in the same order I couldn't exactly even tell you why it's just the context of indie games versus indie games versus some of these indie games versus all other games I just I just put them where it felt right even if it wasn't totally consistent with the last video but uh, you know I'm just one guy I'm allowed to have fluctuating opinions so eat me video go 20 Coming in at number 20 is Assassin's Creed 2, one of the few and last games I ever chose to 100%. I'm not a big completionist when it comes to games. I like to get my time out of a game, and then when I get to a point where I feel like I've really gotten my money's worth, enjoyed all I have to enjoy, I like to move on. I never really feel this sense that I have to totally complete a game in its entirety and Assassin's Creed 2 was one of the few games that managed to really grip me all the way through until the very very end I loved the game I loved the story it took everything that Assassin's Creed 1 did which you have to remember at that time was a very revolutionary action platforming open world kind of game like no other game was playing like Assassin's Creed you know there were only two Assassin's Creed's when this game came out not 15,000 like there are now. Assassin's Creed 2 fixed nearly every issue that people had with Assassin's Creed 1. Some poor pacing issues, some poor platforming issues. It added just a lot more excitement and a lot of technical and basic fixes to the game and a lot of extra layers of gameplay mechanics to mess around with. And it was just an experience from start to finish and a great, great story that ended up not really panning out after this game if I'm being totally honest, at least for me. But, uh, you know, at least at the end of Assassin's Creed 2, hopes were very high. And it was a great feeling, and it was a great game, and that's why it's number 20 on my list. Coming in at number 19 is Limbo. Of course, the game that I have tattooed onto my body has to be on the top 20 list and the top 10 indie list. I won't talk about it too much because I went into a lot of detail about it on the indie list, but basically to sum it up, it's an artistic masterpiece. It proves that games can be art. It proves that stories can take place subtly in the background and still be emotionally impactful, and that you can have creative puzzle solving in a format that isn't a Zelda ripoff. Basically, Limbo's a great game. Number 18, Bioshock. Bioshock was unlike anything I had ever, ever, ever played or thought of playing at the time. This insanely beautiful, 
creepy world set underwater with these wonderful 50s tones between Fallout becoming modernized with Fallout 3 and Bioshock it really launched this trend of like oh my god this like old school like late 40s early 50s nostalgia and music creates these wonderfully haunting tones and themes and settings and Bioshock probably does it better than anybody else who's ever attempted it it builds this constant air of suspense and horror not to say that Bioshock is a particularly frightening game, but you definitely feel that sense of seclusion, of lostness, of desperation, of being lost under the ocean, mismatched and out of place, not just in time, but in setting. And it just truly makes this sense of this crazy world and gives you this perfect opportunity to self-insert yourself as the main character as you explore and discover all the mysteries of this underwater city. Not to mention, of course, the gameplay was incredibly fun, the shooting is great, the characters and villains are great, and all of the plasmid combinations were totally mind-blowing and fun. It was that perfect mix of like zany gameplay and a wonderful, well-set story. I mentioned that I haven't I have literally nothing written down for this. I literally am just looking at titles and just talking shit off the top of my head, so hope you're enjoying this. <laughs> Coming in at number 17 is The Last of Us. Phew! Few games nail the feeling of playing out like a movie in a way that doesn't feel on rails or inhibitive to gameplay. The Last of Us perfectly blends its gameplay with its story to a point where it feels like you're living out this wonderful action-adventure post-apocalypse movie. The Last of Us is a game with near infinite replayability to me, which is insane because it's a single player game. So few single player games I feel really encapsulate the feeling of me wanting to just play over and over again, of me wanting to push myself on harder difficulties because I just want to get more out of the story, out of the experience, out of the world. It takes what is kind of a uh, tired and done concept with what is essentially zombies and turns them into clickers. And even the story itself, the story of dealing in this post-apocalyptic world where everything has changed and crumbled and people are just trying to hang on to whatever humanity they have left, whether there's a sense of family and friendship and love that they can manage to scrounge together in this cruel and harsh world is something we've seen so many times before, and yet somehow, The Last of Us manages to do it in a way that feels new and fresh and totally engrossing from start to finish. I don't know how you can take something that is just honestly such a tired and over and done with idea even at the time that The Last of Us was coming out, it felt, it felt this way. And breathe new life into it. Only Naughty Dog is capable of such greatness. And throwing it way back in time to Super Mario World at number 16, Super Mario World was a platforming game and a Nintendo standard unlike anything we had seen. You see a lot of Super Nintendo games are sequels, but the games they were sequeling were very basic in concept. They were like outlines of what the games could maybe be in the future, and while during the NES days they felt very mind-blowing, the SNES managed to release games and sequels that totally revolutionized how all of these games played, and those SNES games I feel still remain the standard for many of these series to today. And Super Mario World is no exception. Out of all the 2D Mario games, Super Mario World is a cut above all of them. It added new power-up mechanics, new ways to explore worlds. No longer were you just trying to beat every single level and maybe occasionally finding something cool like a warp whistle or some little warp hub to go to different worlds. Now you were unlocking and finding keys to secret areas to unlock whole side worlds. You had the side bonus Star Worlds. Mario World really felt like a world inside of this platforming adventure that you were exploring with these alternating paths, multiple endings to different levels. It was just so unlike anything we had seen in platforming before. It changed the idea that platforming was simply a series of obstacles that you had to get over as a technical challenge and changed it into a sense of exploration and immersion that really didn't exist in that genre up to that point. Super Mario World to me remains the gold standard. I think there's a reason why all the Kaizo hacks that were created were based on Super Mario World and not any of the many other 2D Marios and why when I play Super Mario Maker, Super Mario World is by far my favorite tile set and my favorite worlds to play in. The new Super Mario Brothers, the NES, Super Mario Brothers 3, to some people these games may be their favorite for whatever reason and maybe it's nostalgia somewhat blinding me. 
but I don't think that there's ever been another Mario 2D side-scroller platformer that has really reached such a perfect balance of technical skill and fun as Super Mario World did. And coming in at number 15 is Super Mario Odyssey. Because while the 2D Marios may have been what started it, and what made me fall in love with Mario, Super Mario Odyssey is where Nintendo really took Mario, I think, to his greatest heights. Spoilers, this is the last Mario game on the list. I kind of, like, I love Mario, and I think if I did a top 50 list, you would see almost every, every Mario I've ever played on the list, but they're a lot closer to that, like, that 50 mark, you know? It's, it's weird like that. But Super Mario Odyssey is by far my favorite 3D Mario. I know some people prefer the older style of 3D Mario's where you get given a singular objective to complete in a world, you get tossed back into the hub, you go back into that world, or a different world, or whatever. But to me, just getting placed into a world and having open, uninterrupted exploration of that world is such a more immersive and fun experience that Super Mario Odyssey became one of the first 3D Mario's I've actually ever really beaten. That's probably a bad gamer confession. You guys are probably gonna like totally disregard all of my opinions now that I've said that. As I said earlier when I was talking about Assassin's Creed, I typically play games uh, until I'm no longer really engrossed in them or captured by them. And while I love Super Mario 64 and Galaxy and Sunshine and Galaxy 2, and I think these are all great, great games and I love my time that I've spent with them, the format of those games, of collecting red coins and having to get a certain number of stars to unlock the next world by being forced to do one singular objective at a time, typically creates a roadblock scenario where I run out of stars that I actually want to collect and I'm forced to make a decision of whether or not I want to actually complete any more stars to unlock new worlds that might have new objectives that I would actually enjoy, or if I just want to stop collecting red coins and go play something else. And typically, I stop collecting red coins and go play something else. But not in Super Mario Odyssey. I know some people complain that some of the moons are too easy, but to me that's part of the fun. Some of them are just laying out, easy to find. Some of them are really difficult to find. It forces you to explore and try every idea that you can possibly think of in these worlds before, you know, you inevitably just go online and cheat and look up where they are because you gotta hit 500 moons to get the secret ending. But, I loved Super Mario Odyssey. I thought it was the perfect Mario 3D game for me. And while I can understand if you have a differing opinion on that, I, for one, hope that Super Mario 3D games continue on in this trend of more open exploration as opposed to going to this more linear mission by mission star collecting that previous games have used. Coming in at number 14 is Fallout 3, my personal favorite Fallout, and I love, love, love Fallout. Fallout 3 is the one that made me fall in love with the series. I know a lot of people prefer New Vegas, which is still funny to me, because I remember when New Vegas came out, it was buggy, it was unfinished, there were areas in the game that clearly were meant to be more than what they ended up being at release, and people were mad, and people were upset, and people considered Fallout 3 to be a much superior game, and somewhere over the years, those opinions have drastically shifted in the opposite direction, but I am still firmly in the Fallout 3 camp, maybe because it was my first real Fallout game experience, my first real gaming experience, of this like kind of heavier RPG elements in an open action world in general and it really made me fall in love with the genre and the idea as a whole. I love the setting of Fallout, I love post retro futurism, I always fall in love with that setting, I'm a real sucker for it. Anytime you have that kind of setting in a game or a movie or whatever, I'm always a big fan. It's very immersive, it's very surreal. And to have this open adventure where really anything felt possible, you could explore anywhere, you could interact with all these NPCs in these crazy ways, it felt like you could really do anything. Fallout 3 really made me feel like we had entered a new era of gaming, whereas, you know, in the Super Nintendo world, it was like, look at all the colors and uh, the graphics of this game, and the N64 was like, oh my god, it's 3D. Fallout 3 came out, and it was like, Games can build worlds. Games no longer just build an experience, they can build an entire world that you can get lost in, that you can explore, that you can fall in love with uh, on, a, on a much deeper level because there's just so much here, hundreds and hundreds of hours of content packed in one singular game. And that's what made me really fall in love with Fallout. Coming in at number 13 is Left 4 Dead 2. 
the superior of the two Left 4 Dead games. Really, I could group both of them together because I played Left 4 Dead 1 a ton and then immediately started playing Left 4 Dead 2. And Left 4 Dead 2 now contains all the DLC for Left 4 Dead 1. And, you know, basically, they're kind of like the same game, almost. But Left 4 Dead 2 is probably my most played Xbox 360 game. Do you remember that time when you were younger, or maybe you're this age now, but you had lots of free time on your hand? You had an Xbox Live subscription, and you could go online, you could play cooperative or competitive games, and you could make new friends along the way. Friends who would end up being an important part of your life for years to come. People who you would never even maybe meet in real life, just totally in-game, and yet you might spend hundreds of hours with them across a couple of years of playing games. I had that with Left 4 Dead 2, and a very strong group of friends, some of whom I'm still semi-stay in touch with on Facebook, you know, we've gotten older, things have grown apart, but playing Left 4 Dead 2 online really showed me the potential of what an online game could be, like the experiences and the people and the connections you could make, and it wasn't just because of that, it was because of the game that that was able to grow. Left 4 Dead 2 was an incredibly fun idea for a game, one that I desperately wish would come back. Please Left 4 Dead 3. I know you want to make it, Valve. You want to make games again. Playing Left 4 Dead 2 Versus was such a different experience than any other Versus game out at the time. It wasn't just you versus another team, both shooting at each other, lobbing grenades, playing like Halo or Call of Duty or Gears Online, all these games that really just felt fun but so very similar. Left 4 Dead 2 was a breath of fresh air, a totally different way to strategize and play a versus game with your friends, and even just hopping into single player, playing on the hardest difficulty, unlocking all the achievements. To me, Left 4 Dead 2 was everything that Xbox 360 and Xbox Live tried to capture as an experience at its absolute best, at its most positive, and at its most fun. Coming in at number 12 is Night in the Woods, a game that I also talked about a lot on the indie list already, and my battery on my camera's about to die, so I'm not gonna say too much about it right now, except I really love it because it's a relatable and beautiful story about growing up in a small town, about finding out what success in your life means to you, about dealing with mental illness, about dealing with what makes you different from other people in a positive way. Uh, it's a story about growing up, growing apart, and about just accepting yourself for who you are, and if you can't find something in there that you can relate to, then you're very dead inside, and I would suggest maybe playing the game anyways. Maybe you would find something to make you a little less dead inside. And number 11, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. What really needs to be said about Zelda Ocarina of Time? Not just a defining game for the Zelda series, but a defining game in the history of gaming as a whole. 3D games were struggling at the time. What could they do? What could? How can you transition these games that we know and love into this new dimension? We have to entirely change everything about them, but retain this core idea and feeling of games and developers were swinging a few hits and a lot of misses at this time, and games, a lot of them looked ugly at the time, like, the transition was very rough, but Ocarina of Time proved the potential of moving to this 3D world, that you could take something that was so beloved already as Zelda, and transform it into something entirely new, and somehow even better. Legend of Zelda makes you feel like you're actually in a legendary story, this epic story of old, living it out as you explore from dungeon to dungeon, with all these twists and turns from the narrative, as you win and you lose, and the people you love are hurt, and you have to save them, even after you've failed, you have to just keep trying. Not to mention the gameplay, so, so revolutionary at the time. I mean, imagine just starting with nothing and coming up with the Zelda Ocarina of Time. People have talked about this game to death, so I won't waste too much time on it, except to say that this game, especially to anyone who was lucky enough to play it when it was newer, is was just a, such a moment in gaming history that you could not put it on your greatest games of all time list. So, that's the first part of my list. I need to change my battery on my camera, uh, but join me next week for the next 10 games on my list, the top 10 games of all time. For me, personally, remember this list is all subjective, and remember, I'm making all this up off the top of my head as I go, I have zero things written down, so let me know if you're enjoying this or not. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, check out some streams, keep staying beautiful, and have a wonderful day because you deserve it. I will catch you guys later. Bye-bye.